For more than 60 years now, I've had a love affair with a place called Cupertino. This is where my father settled 71 years ago. This is where my brothers, sister, and I were raised. And this is where I've raised my family. The family holds an essential place in all our lives. It spans generations and transcends cultures. It provides a support system and helps us form our identities. Our families and our histories give us a sense of place and a sense of belonging. As Alta California changed, the lives of its families changed. The first families, the Ohlone people, had new cultures and new beliefs imposed upon them by the Spanish and Mexicans. Mexican and Spanish families settled in the Cupertino area in the 1700s, and by 1850, they too found themselves overrun by the next wave of immigrants. The greatest influence on the changing Cupertino family came from those arriving between 1840 and 1920. The search for a new life, for gold or land, for adventure, or for the chance to pursue the American dream drove these settlers across the Isthmus of Panama, across the plains, and over the treacherous, snow-covered Sierra Nevada mountains. Some of those who arrived safely to fabled California chose to make Cupertino, then called West Side, their home. Not all settlers came together as a family. Men often traveled ahead to search for work before sending for wives and children. One of the first such men who struck out alone to make his riches before marrying was Vincenzo Picchetti. I think my grandfather came over here in uh, 1872 and he worked as a foreman at the Villa Maria, uh, which was the Jesuit priest. They had a winery there and he was the little old winemaker, I guess, or he took care of the vineyards. And then in 1882, he went to Italy, and this is the northern part, and uh, he married uh, but, Teresa Ciccoletti. Yeah, but didn't he buy this place meantime? For, no, I think no? he came, the way I understood it, he came when here, he and when he got back, the, uh, the Jesuit priest said, I think you should, now that you're married, you should go and get some property for yourself and go up in Montebello there. They didn't call this Montebello then. He's the one that named it. And uh, uh, so he got, came up here and he got 160 acres. Many families traveled thousands of miles together, sometimes taking years to finally settle in Westside. Sometimes children completed the immigration that had been started by their parents. William Regnart sailed from London in 1870. After attempts at mining, he purchased over 150 acres of land to plant prunes and grapes. William Regnart Sr. returned to England with sons Robert and Arthur. William Jr. and Harry Regnart stayed in Cupertino and became the fathers of generations of Cupertino Regnarts. My great grandfather from England came with his family of four boys and he came to Cupertino and seemed to love it there and purchased land in 1870. Uh, but eventually the family all went back to England. But my father afterwards left England and went to San Francisco at the age of 19 to 21, where he became a salesman. But I think maybe he became bored with that and knew that the grandfather, great-grandfather, my great-grandfather had purchased land in Cupertino. So eventually he went to Cupertino to uh, farm the land that was left to them. When my father first started to farm the, uh, the ranch, uh, it was about 1894. 
these early families came to Cupertino from many countries. Well, my mother and father came from Denmark. And my father came here in 1907, and my mother in 1908. And they lived about, oh, 20, 20 kilometers apart in Denmark, but never knew one another. And my father's father was a farmer, grain farmer, sugar beets and so forth, had a dairy. And my mother's father was a carpenter, building homes and so forth. And they came, when they came here to the United States, they both went through the Ellis Island deal. And uh, my father settled with his brother who was working up at the Hearst Ranch in Sonol at that time. And my mother went to work as a cook for Professor Guido Marx, who was a chemistry professor at, Santa, at Stanford University. And eventually they met and they were married in 1910. Of all the different countries, none was as well represented as Yugoslavia. One among the Yugoslavs was the Paul Mariani family. My father, after my mother, after Victoria came over here, they were neighbors in Yugoslavia. They, Paul Mariani, the family were friends, and he was very disappointed that she came to America, so he finally dis convinced his parents to let him come. So in 1902, they gave him $40 and bought him a ticket, and he arrived in New York, where he went to work in a coconut factory till he made enough money to get to California. He came to California and uh, went to work in a, a Cooper shop as a Cooper and a wine taster in San Francisco. One day, the Swillich family went to visit this family that, my, that Paul Mariani was living with, and here was Victoria, who he hadn't seen since they left in 1900. So they made a, got acquainted again, and he would drive, ride on his bicycle, I hear, sometimes to, Cal, to Cupertino to see Victoria and the family, or he would ride the train to Sunnyvale and then bring his bicycle and ride to Cupertino. So in 1907, Paul and Victoria were married at the Mission Santa Clara, and they came to Cupertino in 1910. They came from different countries, spoke different languages, but were bound together by a fierce determination to work hard and have a good life. Between 1840 and 1950, Cupertino was a viticultural and agricultural area. Many families either had farm or ranch land or worked in businesses associated with agriculture. Most of these farm families were tight-knit and believed in the value of working together. The roles of fathers, mothers, children, and extended families were clearly defined. In the move to a new country and a new culture, family bonds did not weaken but grew stronger. The role of the woman was of mother, wife, worker, and often disciplinarian for the children. She worked in the field, cut cots, helped with wine production. She also cared for home, garden, and children. Mother was a strong influence on the children and the family in early Cupertino. If we got any trouble with my mother, and uh, she, we knew she was after it and she could run like a deer, uh, we had a quince tree outside in the yard, and we would start running, and she'd be right after us, and she would grab a quince limb off of that tree and never miss a stride, and uh, we paid <laughs> for what we had done. Mother was always home when we got home from school. She was always there to greet us, to hear what happened during the day. We never had to worry about mother. Mother was a very vital part of our life. She was very good to people in the community, and uh, especially the people that came that couldn't speak English, and uh, she could translate and uh, really help people. And we were very proud of her. So, and both mother and dad, they were very proud of us because we tried to do what was right. But then mother died in 1942, and that was a very sad time for us because uh, we missed her very much, and Dad was very lonesome. Because Dad, uh, although Mother didn't work outside, she helped Dad in the ranch, and she was his consultant. He never did anything 
without uh, getting her opinion on it. He may have done as he pleased, but he always came to her and asked what she thought of what, if he went into a new venture, if he was going to lease a new place or what he wanted to do. The role of the man was father, husband, businessman, and farm worker, whether on his own land or on a neighbor's. There were some large farms, but most families farmed fewer than 100 acres. On these farms, the work was done by the family rather than hired labor. My dad had a couple of wagons that he used to haul the fruit out of the ranch in the boxes. My dad did the plowing before the blossoms came out. And he, he had a, a horse, and then he'd borrow a neighbor's horse to make a team. And he'd use that plow and go down that row, I don't know how many times. The, the only, you know, the dirt that you turn over with one sweep was about like 20 inches or so. And that, they'd have to go up and down that row. I don't know. I never thought about it before, but at least 12 or 14 times. That was hard, hard work. Well, the farmer's life down in Cupertino, in those days, the farmers did their own work. Our ranch was, wasn't too large, so my father was able to do most of the work along with myself. But then what the farmers used to do, they used to help one another out. When they sprayed, for example, uh, uh, my father would help the neighbors spray, for example, and whoever had a spray rig. Hard work was a value children learned early. They, too, worked the farms. We had our own chores. Uh, my brother and I used to milk uh, cows. We had three cows, and he'd milk two, and I'd milk one. And Aldo never learned never learned to milk cows. He he wouldn't milk cows. <laughs> but I think Elio, your brother, Elio and Mario, did. and Mario, they'd feed the chickens and do other work. But everybody had his work. And then in the summertime, or when prune season came when we were still younger, we'd have to pick so many boxes of prunes so that we could uh, earn a horse. So when we got so many boxes of prunes, then they'd go down and buy us a horse, remember that? <laughs> Although the work was hard, the children understood their responsibility to the family. In those days, uh, money wasn't too plentiful, so in the summertime, you'd cut apricots. I've cut many of apricot as a child over at the old West Side Dryer and then you'd pick prunes on the ranch. You had to to survive because the, the, the price of fruit wasn't that great in those days. And then we'd cut apricots and, and then uh, the prunes, and that was a hard job to get down on the ground. You have to pick them off the ground. You don't pick them off the tree. And you get hangnails and you get sore knees and sore back and everything, but uh, it didn't hurt us. I mean. I think hard work is good for children, it keeps them out of trouble, and also uh, builds uh, strong backs and strong character. It was a wonderful place for, for me and my brothers to grow up. Uh, we did everything from uh, uh, pick and brush, so to speak, after the pruning was done, driving tractors, driving trucks picking walnuts, picking prunes, picking apricots, cutting apricots, and everything that went with the, uh, the farm uh, business. Besides working in the field, children helped in the home. I didn't play too much because I was the oldest in the family and my mother was sick with arthritis. Well, they called it rheumatism in those days. And so when she had, uh, by that time she had my brother Louie and uh, and uh, then um, there was always things to do. I know I had to wash dieties. My father put the wash tub on the floor and then on the scrub board, and I used to wash the dieties and hang them out. And, and I sort of always had the burden of the family, you know, because my mother was wet, not well, and neither was my father. The old country value of family, as well as the value of hard work, was instilled in these children, children born to a new country. My dad uh, was a family man, <clears throat> who, which I have tried to be a family man. All the, the orientation of the family man goes clear back to his family because they were all very close, caring, sharing, and everything that went with it. But my dad always said to us kids, help one another and work together. 
And one thing that I added to that is to be firm and fair in your judgment. Children also had time for play, often making their playtime and playthings extensions of their work. See, we had these boxes that held about 40 pounds, some of them are out here, that are, held 40 pounds of fruit, and we'd use those boxes for the, to pick the apricots in, to bring them to the shed, and we used them, you know, to cut out of. I mean, we'd pour it on the tray and pour the apricots on the tray and, and cut, out, uh, cut them up. And then when, when the fruit was dry, we scraped the trays and put the dried fruit in those boxes and put them in the barn and then later take them to a packing house. But uh, we also used boxes to make houses out of the boxes and the fruit trays. And for children, that was the most fun because we could imagine that he, these houses look like mansions and we'd go into the house and get some food and we'd go out there and eat it. <laughs> we had lots of fun during the summer building those houses. One thing that we did was to um, pick prunes. There were so, uh, so few people to help the farmers and they used to come and get Pauline and Mildred and me. And we had three pound snowdrift uh, buckets that snowdrift had come in. And uh, we'd pick prunes in those little buckets because that's all we could carry. And, um, but we really weren't very good help because we spent our time throwing uh, stones at uh, horn toads because Warner told us, Pauline's brother, that if we hit them on the head, blood would come out of their eyes. We used to play in the yard. We played hopscotch. We played, uh, of course, we had horse and buggy, so we played horseshoes. We uh, uh, played baseball. And uh, in the summertime, the people used to come to help cut apricots. And uh, we used to, it was always fun for us. We thought it was fun to cut apricots. I mean, it, at that time, just to have people come in, it was company, like going to church on Sunday. We stayed after church and just visited because it was a, a fun time to see all your friends and visit. We had many experiences uh, as young boys living on the Wilson Ranch. My uh, younger brother, uh, Clifford, uh, uh, was cleaning the chicken house uh, one day and he was leaning over the chicken house, uh, cleaning the chicken house, and uh, I had a BB gun and I sh shot him in the posterior area and uh, he came out of the, ch the chicken house uh, running for the house and he no sooner hit the house than my mother started chasing me. School was a very important part of a child's life, a chance to be with neighbor children. We walked three miles to and from school, but later on, my father decided that was too far for us to go, to walk. So they, what we call, or they called in the English, a Surrey, where uh, all of us kids, you know, could fit in that Surrey. It wasn't a buggy, is what the English called Surrey. And uh, so we used that for many years, and sometimes had room to pick up other children on the way. I remember my brothers thought it was great. They used to take the teachers home in the Surrey. In my first year in school, I went to the Doyle School. It was a one-room school in the corner of Stevens Creek and Doyle uh, Road. Miss Fabligan was our teacher. And if I recall, there were three of us in the first grade, Felix Maridon and Marjorie Kraft and myself. As a second grader, I went to uh, Collins School and they built a couple of portable classrooms. Not exactly, they were portable classrooms at Collins School, which I, we had the second grade and the third grade. And then we were in the main Diora Club building, which at that time was elevated up and kind of had a basement underneath it. By 1917, Cupertino had grown to close to 1,000. The need for schools had also grown and the state was asking for more standardization of curriculum. That year, the four country elementary schools, Doyle, 
Lincoln, San Antonio, and Collins were consolidated into the Cupertino Union School District. Mr. Sedgwick was our uh, principal, and uh, we all went to Cupertino Grammar School, graduated from Cupertino Grammar School in 1925, and we all went to Fremont High School, graduated in 1929. And some of us went to different universities. I went to San Jose State, and some of, several of us graduated from San Jose State in 1933. So we had quite an experience. Although the population of Cupertino was increasing each year, some farm families were somewhat isolated on their large or remote property. They relied on the family for entertainment and social contact. We all lived together, so there was uh, two families living in the house. And they were just like, uh, her, her father was just like my father too. Everybody, we listened to everyone and everybody got along fine. That was one good thing about it. Yeah, there was no problems. Neighbors, as well as family, provided social interaction. We had a lot of friends, the, the crafts, the miners, and, uh, and people have been here for years, and, and we would have them over for weekends and play football out in the field. We had a big field there, we played football. And, and we just had a, a uh, uh, it, was, it was family, everybody knew everybody. Uh, if, if we had, uh, say, 700 families in, in, in this area here, we knew people down on Saratoga Avenue. We knew people on Fremont Road. We went to school with them or we knew of their families. And it was a real good thing. There was no hustle and bustle. Um, I remember uh, taking a tractor from over on the Wilson uh, property and uh, uh, taking it down to uh, Stevens Creek Road, crossing Stevens Creek, which was at that time a dirt road. So we didn't have any problem in the matter of of tearing up the road when we crossed over. Our family was a very, very happy family. We didn't have very much, but whatever we had, we enjoyed. Uh, we used to sit on the front porch and watch the traffic go back by to Santa Cruz. There was only a two-lane road from Sunnyvale to Santa Cruz. And at first when we were there, it was just a dirt road and finally got paved. And the people would, there was only one stoplight and that was at the intersection of uh, uh, El Camino and Highway 9. At that time, it was known as Saratoga Sunnyvale Road. So we'd sat there in front and waved at everybody because the cars were stopped. They couldn't get by. There was only the one stoplight, and they just had to stay in. Everybody waved at us, and that was our entertainment. Eventually, we got a croquet set. We used to play croquet, and people would stop and watch us play as we played out in front. Although people lived some distance from one another, the crossroads at Stevens Creek Boulevard and Highway 9 was where they met. Located there were churches, the Cupertino General Store, and the blacksmith shop, all places in which to meet, share news, and knit more tightly together the fabric of a rural community. In the general store, the uh, Cupertino uh, store was uh, uh, owned by Arch Wilson and uh, Harold Dixon worked in there, Bob Trogdon, uh, Con McCarthy, uh, Jenkins, uh, one of the Regnarts and so forth. Uh, everything was in the store. It was a general merchandise store. You could go down there, you could buy hay for your horses, you could buy feed for your chickens, you could buy uh, anything, any of the staples that you needed in your home. I remember how cheap things were, like as a hundred pounds of sugar was five dollars, a loaf of bread was a nickel, and things were very cheap. And I know that uh, sometimes the clerks in the stores would give us kids a little piece of cheese, you know, cut off a little piece of cheese or some candy. And I know they had, uh, at that time, one cent postcards, and I used to look at those because the pictures were so pretty on them. Mr. Calvert used to come around on Tuesdays and take order, and he had a ledger book. And your, your mother might want a, a car carton of oatmeal, or she might want some tapioca, or she might want some salt. And then the next day, they'd deliver those, those uh, groceries. And then also, Joe Enos had a butcher shop in Cupertino, and he had a butcher wagon. He'd come around once a week, and you'd get pork chops, whatever you happen to want to, to want to get. 
We also loved to go to the butcher shop. Mr. Enos had the butcher shop, and he always gave us raw weenies. Doesn't that sound dreadful? But we thought they were delicious. <laughs> Besides food staples, grain, and news, by 1915, the general store also held the library and post office. Before the post office was established in the general store, mail delivery was from an office on McClellan Road. The first one was up at, uh, um, well, near where McClellan Park, you know, is today, up on the side hill. Uh, Belle McComb and her brother had a little post office there. And the, the mail was, it wasn't really a post office, just a kind of a convenience like a convenience post office, and the mail was brought from Mountain View. Well, then when they built the Cupertina store, then they had a little, built a little post office there, and the boxes were, you know, out open to the public, and a lot of Eastern people used to come by and come in and make remarks, you know, they'd never seen post offices out in the open like that, you know, because always there was a little lobby, but we didn't have one at that time. Near the general store was the blacksmith shop, which eventually became Charlie Bear's mechanics garage. And down the road was La Head's ice cream store. On the other corner uh, of Highway 9 and Stevens Creek was the uh, blacksmith shop and the butcher shop. And the, the blacksmith shop, we loved to go by there because Mr. Bear was always making those some wonderful things and the smells were so uh, bad would you say <laughs> but anyhow we thought it was really interesting and uh, the bears were so nice to all of us Lila and Beulah and Webster and Bert social clubs and lodges provided yet another chance to meet neighbors and cement friendships Clubs like the De Oro Club, Oddfellows Lodge, Rebecca's, and King's Daughter Society were popular meeting places. Well, um, I know that I belong to a, a group, and uh, the thing that I remember that I thought was lots of fun, we'd meet at the, um, like the Oddfellows and the Rebecca's and the Wild Eye and um, had a, a skit, they all put on a skit and had it at the school. And that was a lot of fun, especially when the odd fellows did their skit. They dressed like chorus girls. <laughs> For all these men, Mr. Carter, Mr. Larson, Aylesworth, and all, a bunch of them. They came out on the stage and I thought, gee, what funny looking girls. <laughs> they looked so funny. But then I realized they were all men. And they did things like that, but it was lots of fun. And those, uh, that, that, they did that for several years. And then, of course, the community got too big, and I guess they just quit. But those kind of things went on, and they used to have rummage sales and, you know, different things. For entertainment in Cupertino, there was only a, what they call the Cupertino Grange, which everybody in Cupertino went to. They had dancing and cards, plenty of cards. And it was a full house every Saturday night. And they also gave plays there sometimes, and different things for entertainment. And there was music in Cupertino. The Williams family and others formed a band in the 1880s. Gus and Al Williams wrote and played music, and the band played at picnics, socials, and family get-togethers. In the clear air, and the quiet nights, music carried clearly to the community. The family would sit on the veranda of the Bub Ranch House and hear the melodious sounds of voices and musical instruments coming from the Scharf family who lived up Regnart Canyon. In those early years, Cupertino was bound together by a common purpose and common focus, the land and the working of it. The families who lived there in the 1800s and the early 1900s came from many areas, but once settled, stayed to make Cupertino their home. <laughs>